Good evening and greetings, everyone. I'm Professor Ken Bamberger from Berkeley Law and the Diller Institute, and I'm very happy to welcome you all to the 13th annual Robin Collect Robin's Collection Lecture in Jewish Law, Thought, and Identity. This annual lecture is a joint project of Berkeley Law's Robbins Collection in Religious and Civil Law and the Helen Diller Institute's Program on Jewish Law, Thought, and Identity. The Robbins Collection, for those who may not know, is a major center for comparative research and study in religious law. It organizes workshops and conferences and lectures and holds over 300,000 holdings including rare religious law manuscripts that date as far back as the 12th century. We're grateful for the leadership and ongoing partnership of its director, Robbins Professor Laurent Mayali, as well as of Emily Best and the entire staff of the collection. And we look forward to many more years of continued collaboration on religious law at Berkeley. This year, we are honored to host as our Robbins Collection lecturer, Professor Amanda Beckenstein Mbuvi. Professor Mbuvi is an accomplished scholar of the Hebrew Bible and an experienced nonprofit administrator, particularly in the field of adult literacy. Her scholarship, including her book, Belonging in Genesis, Biblical Israel and the Politics of Identity Formation, has made her an increasingly important thinker and public voice on how people think about and live with diversity in the Jewish world and beyond. And last year, she was chosen to head the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College. She's the first Jew of color to lead an Ameri a major American rabbinical school. At the RRC, she's putting into practice curricular reform and a pedagogic vision that in her words will both help root future rabbis in Jewish traditions and also prepare them to engage others in those traditions in all of the diverse embodiments and social locations in which people experience Jewish community, including congregations, but also hospitals and social justice organizations and startup communities and more. Mbuvi earned her bachelor's degree in philosophy and literary theory from Bryn Mawr, a master of theological studies degree from the Palmer Theological Seminary, and both a PhD in religion and a degree in nonprofit management from Duke University. I note that Professor Mbuvi's talk will be followed by a Q&A period. If you have a question, you can send it to me, Ken Bamberger, in the chat anytime during or after the lecture. And uh, uh, I'll give priority to Berkeley students, so please indicate that you are one. Also, this meeting is recorded and will be posted on the Law School Diller Institute website. Please join me, everyone, in welcoming Professor Mbuvi. Thank you. It's good to be with you this evening. Uh, to help us out with our Zoom brain in the evening, I'm planning to use a lot of visuals. Um, so I'll start sharing my screen right away. Okay. So in the first part of this lecture, we're gonna talk about the gap between the diversity within the Jewish people and the perception of Jewish identity. Okay. So this, I'm showing you here a picture of Rabbi Sandra Lawson. She's an African-American woman wearing a baseball cap and a t-shirt that says, this is what Jewish looks like. And so Rabbi Sandra Lawson has noticed that she's often been asked if she's Jewish while she's in synagogue, even while she's wearing a talit, um, that she's even had someone interrupt her during the Amidah prayer, um, staring at her and kind of keeping her from being able to concentrate and focus on her prayer. Another example is uh, Jared Jackson, executive director of Jews in All Hues, has said he hears stories every year about Black Jews being questioned by synagogue security personnel about their presence at high holiday services. And so this is, a, this is an especially important point to note because it's not only 
it's not only a microaggression, it's not only sort of alienating people, it's not only sort of makes them feel um, like they're being other than like they're being made out an outsider. But I think one of the things that the last few years has showed us is that when people of color, especially black people, but not only black people, um, are perceived as being out of place, they are often physically in danger. That that often accompanies people um, calling some sort of security, um, security which can escalate to a dangerous situation. And even if that doesn't happen in every instance, it's the fact that it is a, a common aspect of life that people have to kind of think about and prepare for um, adds weight to those encounters and, and what happens with people in those encounters. So thinking about that, thing is not clicking. Okay, so I want us to, to start digging into this with a fairly simple idea. And this is that Genesis depicts a correspondence between the 70 descendants of Noah in Genesis 10. So there's a genealogy of Noah in Genesis 10, in which he has 70 descendants. And in Genesis, later in Genesis, there's a genealogy of Jacob in which he also has 70 descendants. And so what that suggests, and this is a quote from Frank Kruzman, is that the internal differences among the Israelite people, the descendants of Jacob, are as great as those among the whole of humanity. So this idea of Jewish diversity, it's not something that sort of is new and is sudden and now people are figuring it out. Um, people are talking about it in a different way, but even within Genesis, even within a text as, text as old as Genesis, that idea of diversity is, is there from the very beginning. And so I want to put this quote into conversation um, with, some, with this one from Tarana Burke to help us kind of dig into a, a little bit more, dig into this gap that I referenced between the diversity of the Jewish people and perceptions of Jewish identity. And so Burke writes, there had been this intense public unrest happening in the country after George Floyd and Breonna Taylor were murdered. In private, I was having these really heartfelt conversations with black folks who were just struggling. I can't watch any more of this. I can't take this anymore. I cannot. And in public, the conversation was, how can we get white people to be better? How can we get white people to be anti-racist? Anti-racism became the order of the day, but there was no focus on black humanity. I kept thinking, where is the space for us to talk about what this does to us, about how this affects our lives? And so to put these in conversation together, to see them at the same time, um, what I wanna highlight especially is, is this colored part here. On the one hand, that the internal differences among the Israelite people are as great as those among the whole of humanity. And at the same time, this observation that Burke is making that in the wake of you know, of, of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the conversations that were happening, that the focus was on anti-racism, but not on black humanity. So there was not a focus on thinking about what, thinking about those events from the perspective of black people. And, and that's especially important to think about how that can happen in Jewish spaces because religion is, and has historically been a significant site where black Americans work through the emotional experience of racial trauma and nurture and affirming identity. And I think one of the things that these reactions and, and Burke is not speaking about Jewish life and is not speaking about synagogue life, but I think her observations hold up in this context as well. And so it's important in that connection to really consider what does it mean that not only can someone be both black and Jewish, but that they can be both black and Jewish at the same time. Because I think for a lot of people, there's a sense like, okay, someone can be both and it's like, but the, the way they conceptualize it in their head, it's like a, like a child with divorced parents in a shared custody arrangement. Like they can be black or they can be Jewish, that they, that they have both of those things, but not that they coexist in the same time and in the same person at the same space, that someone is always both. Um, and those, those identities are always together um, and not sort of separable from each other. So what does it really mean to take seriously that those things coexist. Um, so to consider why we have this gap, so we've looked at that there is a gap, but why, why is this so difficult? Why is this something that is, is such a struggle for people to kind of get their minds around and to get used to? And I would argue that it's because the diversity of the Jewish people defies common sense. And when I say common sense, I'm using that in a very specific way um, from Antonio Gramsci where it refers to ways of thinking that are so persuasive as to be invisible 
and so deeply ingrained as to appear incontestable, requiring or admitting no discussion. So common sense is the stuff that's so obvious about the world, we don't even think to say it. We don't even bother to notice it. It's just sort of how things are. We don't question how it got that way. We don't really think of it as something that can change. It's just really baked into what the way that we, we assume that the world works. And so when it comes to identity in the American context, that common sense is structured by something I like to refer to with the social ladder. And so the social ladder is an image used by Keenan Malik to describe the relationship between older ways of thinking about identity and kind of some of the ways that have, have come into place since then. Although the last few years have made it difficult to sort of know if we can still kind of use that temporal framing because we've, our attitudes are all over the place right now. But um, anyway, what, what he's connecting is this picture here, we have a vertical ladder, a ladder pointing upward with one rung above the next. And that rung represents a hierarchical view of racial difference. So there, this idea that this people is better than the people above them, is better than this people, is better than this people, and so on up the ladder. I would say that's not popular so much anymore. Who knows what's happening right now? Generally, people, a lot of people who would say this comes out of favor, but who knows? Um, but what's happened instead is that we have something like this. And so this is the same ladder, this is the same picture of the ladder, but the ladder has now been turned on its side, it's horizontal. And so the view of identity that thinks about, um, that thinks about identity existing in a series of identical boxes. So what we may not realize is that a lot of the views of diversity that emphasize equality and that emphasize multiculturalism, um, while they've gotten rid of the hierarchy, there's still a kind of structural framing that's been retained. And this idea is, um, what I really like about this image of the ladder is how much, how easily it sort of translates into the forms we fill out where people check a box. Um, you know, your identity is represented in a box. You can check one box. Now, sometimes we let people check two. Um, when I was growing up, that was not something people were allowed to do. Um, but the, the idea that, you know, every identity fits in one box and only one box and every box is the same as every other box. So that means all kinds of identity, all different forms of identity are doing the same work. They're all comparable to each other. They're all interchangeable. Um, we can think of them all as structurally similar. In the US context, the common sense around, um, around identity, especially when it comes to religion, has, has reflected a lot of the history of people navigating slavery. So in the, I want to say in the 1700s, so in the, in the in, um, earlier in the history of this country, when th there was a, there's, there's letters from clergy kind of reflecting a challenge that they were facing in the community. On the one hand, there was an impulse. They felt, well, as Christians, it was their Christian duty to, to try to get slaves to be Christian. But then there was this confusion because if they became Christian, then they would be brothers and sisters in Christ, but they were slaves, so that was awkward. What were they, what should they do? And so the way they resolved that tension was to say that religion has nothing to do with social identity. Those are fully separable things. So a slave could be baptized, could become a Christian, but that did nothing to their slave status. It had no impact on their, their social position. And so this idea that that race, that religion, that that race is unchangeable and that religion operates on top of race, but it doesn't change race. It doesn't speak to race, that race is something sort of absolute. Um, that is part of, of sort of the history of thinking through religion in this country. And it's something that's, that's influenced American Judaism, even though it didn't arise um, in a Jewish community or working through um, issues in a Jewish community. It's become very much part of the way that Americans think about religion. And so to help us think into this a little bit, um, I wanna bring in a case study. And this is from the ethicist column in the New York Times. And the writer, uh, the, the writer asks the person writing in, can I call my non-biological twins black because my husband is? She says, I'm a Caucasian woman married to an African-American man. Shortly after we married, I discovered that I couldn't conceive my own biological children. We opted to adopt two embryos. Couples who have successfully undergone in vitro fertilization and don't wish to have more children can donate remaining embryos to other couples. I was soon pregnant and gave birth to twins. 
Based on the records of the fertility clinic, we know that our children are genetically mixed Hispanic and Caucasian. I am not comfortable being open about the origin of my children, except with family and close friends, until they are old enough for me to explain it to them. However, several times in the last three years, I've been asked about their race, most recently on a pre-K school form. On this form, there is no option of mixed race or other. Therefore, I identified my children as Black. Was this the right choice? So what I want to focus on actually is not so much the answer to this question, um, not so much the question itself, but a complaint written subsequently to the ethicist about the ethicist's response to the question. And the reader responds, how is this an ethics question? The woman's white, the husband's black, the children come from neither of them, they are what they are. We're told that based on the records of the fertility clinic, we know that our children are genetically mixed Hispanic and Caucasian. I didn't see the word black in there. So how then can the children be called black? And I think this idea that this writer is raising is like, they are what they are. That this question has a right answer. There is a definitive answer and it has nothing to do with the parents. That the identity of, this children, of these children is entirely independent of the parents and the parents have nothing, no, no, they don't shape it in any way because it is born and it is genetic. It is inborn and it is genetic. This idea that race is, is given kind of from the beginning and inalterable. Here. Um, so to kind of summarize here, we have a gap because there's this assumption that all identities are equivalent and separate. There's an expectation that people have one, only one identity that fits within the boxes of the social ladder. And this kind of thinking that says they are what they are, that regards race as an unalterable bodily reality, that race just is. So all of these things contribute to the gap between the diversity within the Jewish people and the perception of Jewish identity. So moving forward, how can Genesis help us move beyond the gap? So this, I, I like this sound. Um, so this is a, a sign from Ireland and it's actually pronounced obviously Dunleary. And the reason I like this is because what Genesis does to identity is what the Irish language does to the English language brain. The way that this violates every rule of how letters sound and what they do, and it turns you upside down if you're looking at some sort of done leo care, dune leo care, um, but it's done leery. Um, the way that it causes that kind of confusion, I think Genesis is very similar in the way that it handles identity. So for people trained in the common sense of our culture, um, Genesis is, it messes with our heads quite a bit. And so some of the ways that it does that is that Israel arrives late to its own story, by which I mean that um, in contrast to kind of other stories similar from similar times and places, in the Babylonian creation story, we know right from the beginning that Babylon is occupying a central space from the beginning of, that, of the Enumelish. But in Genesis, we get 11 chapters before we even get the call of, of Abraham. Um, 11 chapters before even the, the beginnings of Israel begin to emerge. And even then it's just the call of Abraham. By the end of the entire book of Genesis, Israel is still not a full-fledged people. It is sort of the sort of large uh, family of Jacob, but it is not a people in the sense that it will become. So the entire first book of the Tanakh um, does not actually have Israel present in its fully fledged, um, in its fully fledged form. So another way that it does this is that it, it, it stays on this level of family. So even though there is a sense in which a lot of the individuals in Genesis are in some sense representatives of a group of people, it's not a coincidence that there's someone named Moab and there's a people named Moab and then Esau is named Edom and there's a people Edom. So it's not as though those, those peoples aren't in view, but the fact that the story is told from the perspective of family and that it really does not kind of focus on the national level is something that's really challenging for contemporary readers. And so it's interesting to me as someone who studies identity that the people who like to talk about identity didn't like to talk about Genesis because it didn't have any of the stuff that they needed. So people like to talk about um, texts from the Persian period, they like to talk about Ezra and Nehemiah, they'd like to talk about things like that because they felt like here we have good ethnic conflict. Genesis doesn't have, um, doesn't 
have that infrastructure that people are expecting that we feel like is necessary to talk about identity. And so one of the ways that people would try to make that work is to use history to kind of bring that back in, to say, okay, in the story, we've got this happening, but who are the people? Um, obviously something happened historically um, that is not in dispute. Um, something happened historically that, people, that caused people to tell these stories in this way. But what I think is really important is to take seriously, why is the story told the way it is? What if we take seriously this idea of not having the groups given? What if we take seriously this idea of the people in the book of Genesis being within this liminal space? What if we stay in the liminal space and not try to make it conform to the fully defined, the fully defined identities that we're accustomed to thinking about? What if we let it be in flux? What if we what if we let it be um, what if we let it be different? So another way that Genesis confounds the way we think about identity is that it focuses on migration instead of a settled, stable community. So there was somebody who um, somebody studying nationalism in relation to the Bible, and they talked about nationalism as being kind of a people in their place. And yet Genesis has Israel not yet a people, not yet in a place that it focuses on people on the move, but there, there's, there's not a community that is settled, settled and stable in a particular place. It's focused on people who are in transition. And in the call of Abraham, God tells Abraham to leave and doesn't even specify the destination at that point. He says, go to the land that I will show you. He doesn't even say, go to you know, X place. He says, go to a land that I will show you. Um, and so in that way, it really puts the relationship ahead of reaching finality in identity. So God doesn't take Abraham from like, you were this and now you're this other thing. It was like, you're not this anymore and go with me. So the, the new identity is something that emerges really gradually over the course of the book of Genesis. It's something that, that Abraham and his family kind of live into in relationship with God, kind of it, it sort of, they work through it. It gets kind of worked out over the course of Genesis. And it's certainly not something that other people in the book of Genesis would recognize. So it's not like Abraham, when God calls Abraham, Abraham takes on a new social identity of some sort that other people immediately recognize and know what it is. Um, so if we think about, for example, the word Hebrew in the book of Genesis, um, it, Genesis does not use the word Hebrew the way, say, Exodus does. Um, Hebrew is only a word that other people apply to um, to Abraham and the descendants of Abraham, Joseph uses it once in talking about himself to other people. So even kind of framing himself for outsiders. So it couldn't be, if we're sort of reading along with the story, it couldn't be sort of a fully fledged ethnic identity, racial identity of some sort that everyone recognized and understood because it was still just a largest family and people wouldn't necessarily understand that as being different. So part of what Genesis gives us is this tension between a new emergent identity um, that's, that's rooted in the divine call to peoplehood and the ways that other people are used to thinking about identity, that those things continue to coexist. Um, and finally, that Genesis really stays with this in-between liminal space, um, that it stays with this space that kind of pushes our rules. It doesn't, um, it doesn't resolve things. It doesn't move to quick solutions. It doesn't fill in the blanks. It stays with the weirdness. So thinking back to the letter to the ethicist, so this, this, this person writing, her, there's a sense in which her children are a puzzle, right? Trying to figure out how to explain her children's identity, but it's not actually because of the children. It's because of the form she has to fill out. That's what makes it complicated. Um, the whole kind of long story, it's because she has to fill out a form and because she has to represent her children in terms of a series of pre-given categories, that's why it becomes complicated. That's what makes it an issue um, because we don't make space for that kind of thing. We are used to identity as something that can be regulate, regular and regulated. And so we want kind of the answer check one box and Genesis really, really messes with that. I mean, even to the point of Oh, sorry to go there, but uh, there's, a, there's an episode in Genesis where there's incest between a father and his daughters, and that produces two new ethnic groups. So if you're trying to put any kind of genetic spin on identity, that alone just 
blows that out the window. Okay, Genesis also um, provides an alternative to our common sense and helps us move beyond the gap because it has a different way of structuring identity. So in contrast to the social ladder, we can think in Genesis about the family tree. And so here's a picture of a very large tree with great reaching branches and green leaves. And the tree, the family tree is Genesis, is the way that Genesis structures identity. So in Genesis, genealogy gives Genesis its structure. So this formula, Ele Toldot, these are the generations of, is, is the structural device for the book. So when we read Genesis, the chapters, the verse numbers, all of those things are not original. Those were things that were added to the text to make it easier for readers. They were not part of how the text was written. Um, you know, different parsha, that none of that was sort of part of how the text was structured. The internal structuring device to the book of Genesis is this formula here. This phrase right here is how Genesis kind of makes div divisions, how it divides the book into sections. Um, so this, um, this is how Genesis, so this idea is really important in Genesis, not only because family is so prominent in the narratives, but also because it's, it is literally providing the structure of the book. And Genesis uses this, this family in some really interesting ways. So for example, it's, it's used to introduce sort of traditional genealogical lists, but it's also used to describe the cosmos. So it, it's used for, for beyond humans. So this idea of family, it's not just one particular family, but it's even beyond humanity. So it's used in some very inclusive ways. And there are people who want to sort of translate that away or kind of make that um, make that not be weird, but I think there's something really rich in how weird that can be to us. Um, because it, I think there's some really powerful theological ideas communicated in how Genesis uses this genealogical language. Um, that it, it sets up this network of relationships. It sets up, there's a lot of, um, it's a way of thinking about the world. And so to kind of help us to get this kind of genealogical mindset, you can imagine being introduced to someone you've never met before. And then imagine someone told you that person is your cousin. Still never met the person, never laid eyes on them, never occurred to you that they exist in the world. But now someone is introducing you and they said, this is your cousin. And that for a lot of people can immediately change things. Um, and so I think what that kind of helps us recognize is that there's something about genealogy, even if we don't have an experience of family with this person, that just knowing that there is a family relationship can foster a certain kind of sense of connection. Um, in societies where genealogy, genealogy plays a stronger role, so for example, in my husband's culture, um, in, in his village, like if you're speaking, if you're speaking the, their language, they, to even greet someone, you need to know how they're related to you. Like even just to say hello, you need to have some sense of kind of who they are to you. It's such a, it's such a part of daily life. It's such an active part of daily life. Um, and it's to, to think of genealogy, not just in a sort of, um, to think of genealogy beyond DNA, but to think of genealogy as something, as a way of structuring society. And so to kind of help us see how that use of genealogy is so different from some of the ways we might think about genealogy now, um, or genealogy from a genetic point of view, is, is to consider, um, and I wish I could remember the culture that this comes from, I cannot, and I have not been able to find it to tell, but so there was an example of a genealogy where there was some, there was a point that was fuzzy. There were two names in the genealogy. This is a, this is a genealogy, not from the Bible, but this is a genealogy of a culture, of an active culture. And the people couldn't, there was some confusion about were these two names two different people? Um, were they two names? Were they two names for the same person? Was it a husband and wife? They weren't really sure what those two names are. The reason it mattered was because people were trying to get married. And it wasn't like it was an incest situation, but the logistics of how that worked was kind of dependent on resolving what was going on with these two names in the genealogy. And so the way the situation was handled was to decide, well, what is the optimal outcome for this couple getting married? And based on that, they corrected the genealogy and that was binding. So they made a kind of, they, they made a, a fixed, I don't wanna say fixed, but they made a authoritative change to the genealogy 
based on a contemporary situation. They were not at all trying to say, well, historically, if we had a security camera filming these people, what would they see? Would they see one person or two people? They weren't trying to figure out sort of what really happened. They were figuring out, well, what does this mean for how it explains who we are as a society, who we are as a people, and how we relate to one another? And so when genealogy is doing, genealogy is something that can do that kind of work. Um, and when it's doing that kind of work, it works in a very, it operates in a very different kind of flexible way um, than some of the ways that it shows up here. And in Genesis, I think one of, I think that goes, um, I don't think I do. Well, yes, I do actually. So in Genesis, Genesis juxtaposes these two views with one another. Um, we have the family tree and we have the social ladder. And one of the ways that we see that is in Genesis 10, which we started with, the 70 descendants of Noah, is a genealogy. Um, and it's a messy genealogy. It sort of goes all over the place. It's not, the categories don't quite line up. Sometimes people try to fix it. Um, I don't think the point is to really fix it. I don't think it's trying to do something orderly and failing. I think it's, it's being, it's accurately capturing the messiness of identity as people live it. Um, but in the juxtaposition between Genesis 10 and Genesis 11, and Genesis 11 is what people call the Tower of Babel. It's, it's the story of building the tower and stuff. So when we have a story that reflects um, imperial influence, we can actually see the, we can see two different ways of thinking about who people are. We can see the family tree um, and we can see the Tower of Babel is in many ways a social ladder par excellence. Um, And so a lot of what's happening with the genealogy in Genesis is that it's doing theological work as something that has cultural significance. So by the time it gets to Genesis, it may not be able to structure society in the way that it did. But the very idea of looking at genealogy in that way is itself an alternative to other ways of classifying people. It is another kind of a source of doing that. Um, so, yeah. Let me ask you guys. Yes. Um, let me ask people. We can open the chat for a moment. Um, why isn't the tree symmetrical? Is there something wrong with it? I am lost my cursor. Okay. Oops. Okay, sorry, my computer's acting up and it's not letting me move the chat and have a cursor at the same time. Um, Yes, I'm, I'm seeing that many trees grow in a spiral. Yes. Yeah, so we don't necessarily, if we look at a ladder, oops, come back. If we look at a ladder, a ladder is constructed, so it is perfectly symmetrical and orderly and everything kind of lines up in that way. But a tree um, grows in response to the circumstances in which it grows. So if a tree grows by the side of the house, the, one, the side close to the house might be flat while the branches stick out another way. Trees have all kinds of shapes and that's part of how trees work. Um, and so one of the things that's really rich about this idea of the tree thinking about identity is it's normal for trees to be weird. It's normal for trees to kind of have all these divergences. Um, it's, that's what makes trees healthy. That would, that's what makes trees able to bear fruit. Um, that it can sort of respond to its circumstances and be flexible. And something that I think is especially powerful to note in this context is that the tree and the ladder are both made of wood, right? So this picture of the ladder is a wooden ladder and that's not a coincidence that there is a relationship, there's a way in which the rules of race and identity as we know them, it's not like they just sort of developed and then people applied them to everything, including the Bible and including stuff, but that they actually, um, 
that they actually developed in strategies for reading the Bible, that part of how people develop some of the categories of identity and ways of thinking about identity came as strategies for Bible reading and conceptualizing the relationship between people and the Bible. So to recap some of the points about family in Genesis, that it emphasizes the relationship with the connection and responsibility of humans to, to one another and to all creation. It emphasizes the connection and responsibility of all humans to one another. It provides a way of describing the world that acknowledges the complexity of social status. And what I mean by that is if you think about something like the family of Jacob, where he's married to, um, he's married to Leah, then he's married to Rachel, and then he has children with Bilhah and Zilpah, and you know, all these kind of nuances and things that in addition to being sort of an interesting family story, if you think about it as a way of, of mapping a society, it gets at all the, the nuances of, um, the nuances of, of the favored wife, the less favored wife, the maidservants, all those kinds of things um, are ways of kind of getting at the nuances of the different status of people in a community, sort of being part of the family, but sort of part of the family differently. And a final point about family in Genesis is that it makes the identity rooted in the divine call to peoplehood more important than identity according to human categories. Um, because there's this emphasis on family, because there's this, because there's this divine call to peoplehood, and I'm referring here to the call of Abraham in Genesis 12, um, because there's such an emphasis on that and because of the way it disrupts and it disrupts kind of ways of thinking about identity by not providing answers, it really places the identity squarely in the divine call, even especially in the way that Abraham doesn't get a new identity fully fleshed out, but that Abraham's new identity is contingent on that relationship with God and it emerges over the course of relationship gradually over time. And now I just went to chat. Okay, why is it putting everything? Okay. I meant these to come up one. Okay, so to kind of to summarize some of the key points here, um, let me so I'll move this. Okay, so to summarize some of the key points. So first of all, according to Genesis, the Jewish people is as diverse as humanity is diverse, and that's a perspective that can govern how we think about who belongs and what about them is Jewish. So point number two. Genesis rejects the people, rejects the idea that people are what they are, that identity is this fixed, unchangeable thing people are born with. Um, it really presents identity as something subject to transformation at the deepest levels. And as depicted in Genesis, B'nai Israel, the people of Israel, uh, it doesn't operate within the confines of race. It's not just sort of, as depicted in Genesis, sort of taking a group and kind of coloring within the lines, um, but it's actually transforming identity. And finally, that in the family tree, Genesis presents a way of conceptualizing belonging that doesn't assume uniformity and that acknowledge diversity even within a household. And so we can stop there for questions. Can you stop the screen share? Okay, I'd love to hear your questions. Uh, thanks so much. Um, I've gotten uh, a couple of questions in. Um, let me start with kind of a big one, uh, which is, what do you think this understanding from Genesis says about the debate that people keep falling into and maybe um, the mistake uh, that people keep making um, 
maybe Jews, maybe non-Jews thinking about Jews in terms of what Judaism is. What lessons does this have about what Judaism is? A religion, a race, a nation, a people, a family. Um, obviously, um, those are um, many of the modern concepts, but what, what can Genesis bring to that and does it matter? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, yeah, I mean, one of the things that's fun and kind of looking at the, his, the history of some of these categories and how they developed and, and how people came to relate to them the way they do is to, to watch people stumble over what to do with Jews. Um, to sort of be like, it's a, but it's a religion, but it's a people, but it's a race, and, you know, just, just all over the place and kind of having a hard time, which is really fun. Um, and I think it really speaks to something of how the category of Jewish especially is difficult to classify and is disruptive in a lot of ways to, to some of the ways of thinking about this. I think if we, if we picture this image of the latter, it's this idea that I think, first of all, we have to get past the idea that all the boxes are the same that not only can you, if you say you're this versus that, um, that not only are those two different things, but those two different things are equivalent. That in other words, I mean that they're structured the same way. And that's why it's confusing if someone says, well, is Jewish like Italian? Is Jewish like Presbyterian? Um, and the answer is yes. <laughs> that there are things in common with both of those, things that are different from both of those. But with a, within a social ladder framework, there's this assumption that the, all the boxes are identical. So if we let go of that, and if we say, well, not, not identical, um, that can sort of free up a lot of space to, to see things in some more flexible ways. Um, I think this idea of Jewish peoplehood is really powerful. Um, peoplehood as something that is not the same as race, that is not the same as ethnicity, that is not the same um, that is not the same as any of those things. And I think, I think there's a sense in which we hold on to that even as we don't fully live into its possibilities. So for example, if we think about someone converting to Judaism, um, when someone converts to Judaism, they, they get put in the genealogy, right? So if they get called to the Torah, they get called as you know son or daughter or child of, of or house of um, Abraham and Sarah. So they, get, they become part of the family tree. And people don't really have a problem with that if they're thinking about like an Aaliyah. But to, what does it mean to really, to really take that seriously? Like, what does it mean to say that someone can actually join the family? Um, if we don't, if we, if we think about Judaism as operating in accordance with its own rules and not having to sort of play by the social rules of what a that decide, well, what is a race or what is an ethnic group or what is a religion and how do they act and how do they, what role do they play in a person's life and how do they change? If we let those rules go and consider some of the things that are already captured in Jewish tradition, I think it, it provides a more flexible way of thinking about these things. Uh, a number of folks have kind of followed up in a more concrete way. Um, <clears throat> one writes, how do we then get the non-Jewish world to not force all Jews, not just Jews of color, into the white box, particularly with regards to um, diversity training and, and other contexts in which people have to self-identify? Is there a way to, so, I mean, you, you welcome obviously to disagree with the premise, but if if this is a discomfort among at least some component of Jews, um, is there a way to take the insights of Genesis and turn them into kind of public argument or public persuasion? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. I think, I think it's important to see two things at the same time. I think it's important to we can look at the social ladder and we can talk about the social ladder um, and we can reject the social ladder, but that doesn't change the impact that it's had on our history and the way that it continues to shape our present. So we do have to reckon with this world that we live in and the rules that it follows and the ways that it acts, even if as we can work to change and transform and, and, and kind of move those things in a different way. So we need to, we need to see that um, that we can't just disagree it out of existence. 
Um, we need to see it as something that's really there. And so one of the things that I think is so powerful for us with Genesis is that it actually models that, that Abraham gets this transformative identity from God and no one else knows it, you know, still has to figure out what it means, still has to deal with people who are, you know, their life has not changed at all, the way they see Abraham has not changed at all, that he kind of has to live with both. Um, that, you know, to look at how that functions for, for Abraham and then especially for people like Joseph and kind of looking at how that plays out. Um, so I think there's two pieces. I think we really need to, in terms of thinking about I think there's thinking about Jewish peoplehood and there's thinking about what it means for people living in the US. Um, and so I guess hmm. there's a few different ways to explain this. Um, so for me, I think one of the things, one of the ways to sort of, if we, if we think back to the, the ethicist case study and the person who was saying, well, what am I supposed to call my children? Um, if we were really serious and if we were doing a better job, we would stop asking about identity as by asking one question. We wouldn't say, what are you? We'd ask maybe like seven questions, right? We, we, because there's some identity is, um, identity is a family inheritance. Identity is your genetic predisposition to it, diseases. Identity is your name and what, you know, how people perceive your name. Identity is what people assume that you are by looking at you, whether or not that has anything to do with anything in your life. Um, identity is the culture that you grew up in and received. Um, sometimes these kinds of things line up with each other. Sometimes these things point in different directions and that's fine and we kind of need to see all of them and sort of notice how all of those things working. So one of the things I would say is that even as we as we think into, into how we um, talk about, I guess I'll say from I'll say from an internal perspective, as as Jews talk about being the Jewish people and try to live out in some way being Jewish people and being, building Jewish community with other Jewish people and kind of doing those things, um, thinking about how that's done, but that that work continues to happen in a larger society with its own history and perceptions and things like that. Um, so it's not just, I don't think, I think what Genesis gives us for diversity training, it doesn't, hmm. It doesn't give us the history of race in the US. What it gives us is a vision that the history of race in the US doesn't have to be the future of race in the US. That we can actually, we have to sort of deal with things as they are and as they have been. And we can build towards how things could be and what might be better. Um, it can give us a, a vision and an inspiration for um, better ways of thinking about human diversity, thinking about and living with diversity that are more, um, that are more constructive, that are more inclusive, that are more, um, that have a better impact on the world. So I think it's more there. I think we really have to, to see a lot of that in relation to American history. And, it, and that maybe Jews are desperately in need of intersectionality and the insights of intersectionality. If uh, at the same time, as individuals, we are what other people are projecting on us, each individual based on how we look and how we appear and then we're another thing ourselves, And so we fit in some boxes sometimes, but in others, other times and sometimes no boxes. Um, maybe that's, that's the greatest insight of all. Um, I had a question you, um, my sense was, uh, when you were talking about the genealogical insights of Genesis um, and the genealogical language uh, that in your book and your research, you had a number of, um, uh, of uh, I don't wanna say extreme, but elements of the family tree that were really on the edge and that really pointed out uh, exactly the twists and turns that the family tree can take. But obviously in the lecture context, there's only so much time you have. Um, might you share with us some that you feel are, uh, are really the most illustrative? Sure. Um, 
you know, you were talking about inhumanity and beyond humanity. Yeah, so there, there are a couple of things to highlight. So first, I think that first instance of the, the application of genealogy to the cosmos and this idea of extending this, this the if we think of family as something that conveys connection and responsibility, the idea that that extends beyond um, that, well, we'll look at a couple of things. So looking at, looking at the beginning of Genesis, that it extends beyond humanity, um, that it's something that binds all creation together, that that network is depicted as family. Um, looking at how Genesis is set up, what are the consequences of taking so long to get to Abraham? And I'm just gonna call him Abraham, the names change, it's hugely important and it's also kind of confusing. So I'm gonna say Abraham, I'm not gonna keep changing everyone's names, but, um, but so that it takes 10, uh, 11 chapters before we even get to him, that part of what that does is it situates what's happening with Abraham in relation to all the things that came before Abraham. And so that the whole, all of humanity is connected under the umbrella of family, that there is a genealogical link to every living person. Um, and not just in a sense of, and to really think about that beyond like, oh, isn't it cute? They thought everybody was cousins. Like not look at it as some sort of naivete that people leaned into because they didn't have science and complexity or something like that. Um, ancient people were not more simplistic than we are. They were doing very sophisticated things in their own way. Um, but what it really means to think about that there is no one who is an outsider to the sphere of our concern, connection, and responsibility. Hmm. Um, that I think there's something really powerful in kind of in how how those that genealogy is sort of used and expanded and is and is happening in such an inclusive way. Um, sometimes people will like to read Genesis in a sort of get to the point kind of way where they're thinking like the point is to get to Jacob um, who becomes Israel. I said, I wouldn't do the name change and I just did. But the point is to get to him. We're trying to get to, you know, like as if we're trying to get to one, like it's a reality show or something and we're like voting people off until we get to the winner. Um, but that's really not how Genesis is presenting things that it's not just about sort of getting rid of the other people till we kind of get to the line we're going with, but that, that they're always connected. Um, that they are, I think this, that they are connected as family and that those relationships are important and that every time something happens that might make us question that Genesis makes, doesn't let us let it go. So when Abraham and so when Abraham sets out, he sets out with his nephew Lot and then there's a point at which they separate. As soon as they separate, Lot gets in trouble, Abraham comes to his rescue. So there's a sense, okay, we're not getting rid of Lot. Um, we have, um, we can think about you know, the rivalry between Joseph and his brothers and it's very complex. But in some ways, I think one of the most interesting examples is the one who, the sort of aborted rivalry of Isaac and Ishmael. Um, and, and part of how I see Genesis is that the reason that Isaac is such a weird presence in the book in that we get a lot of Abraham stuff, we get a lot of Jacob and Esau stuff, but most of the Isaac stuff, it's like little bits of in the middle of the Abraham stuff and in the middle of the Jacob and Esau stuff. He, he's, he's kind of a weird presence. He doesn't have like a clear era or, you know, where he's central in the book. And I think one of the reasons for that is because Ish, because his, his half-brother Ishmael is sent away, um, that he doesn't have a rival. And because he doesn't have a rival, he can't model this very essential feature of being in relationship with the rival. Um, that somehow there's this difference and connection and the differentiation and the connection go together. They're not sort of opposing mm -hmm. forces. Mm -hmm. um, and that even within this differentiation, there are also many covenants. There's not just one covenant in Genesis, but there are many layers of covenant. For example, the covenant of circumcision, which is all of Abraham's descendants, including Ishmael, including, you know, so including Esau, you know, that, so that includes people. So it's not like there's just one covenant and everyone is in or out. There's a covenant of Noah with every living thing. So there, there are all these sort of layers within layers. Um, and it's not just kind of a, a binary it's not, thing. It's not a straight ladder. Right. Hmm. Um, here's a question. How does gender somewhat fluid in parts of Genesis, 
as well as patriarchal hierarchy and filial responsibility or competition, which you just talked about a little, and the chronic subversion of primogeniture. What do those say about family and individual identity that we can learn from? So gender and patriarchal hierarchy and what was the last part again? Oh, and um, the uh, uh, competition between siblings and then subversion of primogeniture. Um, so what do we take from these parts of the story uh, in terms of thinking about identity and lessons of identity? I guess you could start with gender. That seems like um, another intersectional layer, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the ways that I want to answer this question is I want to sort of turn it in a, in a kind of different direction. So in, mm. instead of sort of saying, well, here are the conclusions, I think, I think part of Genesis is really weird. I mean, these stories are really strange. And we also, we get people making choices and we look at the rivalry and we look at like where Isaac and Rebecca right to play favorites was Rebecca adequately following the word of God before she was born or were they creating issues with their children and how they related to them. We don't, we don't get that resolved. We get Abraham saying his wife was his sister. Next story, like we don't get, and that was a bad idea that was understandable, but misguided, that was deeply problematic. We don't, we don't get the analysis. And I think what that, I think what we take from that is not so much, what we take from that is that we're, is this process of reading the stories together and discussing it and debating and working out their meaning. So it's not so much that these stories point us to something in that way, but it also, the fact that we read them with each other, the fact that we read them with people for thousands of years, you know, who've been reading them for thousands of years, that it binds us to people in different places and times, and that we wrestle with these stories and debate their meaning and their import. That is the takeaway, I think, that I think that, that there's this, that on the one hand, there's a sense that these stories are given to us as somehow speaking to who we are, if we're looking at Genesis as Torah, that there's, we're thinking about it as like, if this is something that's somehow supposed to be not just authoritative, but definitive, that it's supposed to explain something about what it means to be the people Israel, um, that what we get a lot of the times is the process and sort of the people that we sort of work that out with. So I think in a lot of ways, the takeaway there is is the debate and is the sitting there saying, well, this is deeply disturbing. Um, this is not, or no, it's not, or yes, it is, or actually, is that, you know, but that, that sort of arguing about it um, is itself, I think, the best answer. Um, a number of people, a whole bunch of people are writing in, um, both from kind of a personal experiential view standpoint and also kind of more theoretical thinking about the, um, way identity is both created oneself and by other people labeling you. So here's a question that I think kind of sums that up. Um, I think of identity as a combination of self-definition and other ascription. I wonder how that fits with Genesis. Where was the tension between self and other uh, ascription for Abraham's family and descendants in Genesis? How much was other? How much was self? Mm -hmm. I mean, you made the good yeah, point that um, Abraham kept it a secret for a long while. Or not kept it a secret, but it was not something he went out and shared. Right. And even, I mean, and even if he did, it wouldn't have meant anything to people. Like, I guess if you go around declaring yourself a new people, that people mostly will think you're weird. I don't think, I think even back then, I don't think that was something people really did. Um, he also did it in a storeroom full of, you know, uh, hundreds of idols of gods of all kinds of other people. So it may not have seemed that, uh, uh, that, that revolutionary. Yeah, although that part's not actually in Genesis. That's Midrash. And that's true, um, you're right. Yeah. So yeah, which is which is part of the interesting thing about Genesis. I mean, so much of what 
So much of our strongest associations with the book don't actually come from the book. No apple, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I think I think that's part of what's interesting about it too. Um, yeah, I think the most. I think there's a lot of different things going on. Um, I think there's something subversive about the use of the genealogical framing and language um, in a time when its social function was not as kind of current and active in the same way. So what it means to take something that is a way of structuring society when it's not sort of, when there's something, when there's another alternative people are being kind of put into to kind of bring, to kind of point to that. I think that, that, there's, a, that there's a sense in which the very framing of it is, it's offered as a, it's a perspective, it's a foundation because Genesis is the beginning, but also in historical context, we can say it's a counter perspective. Um, and even within Genesis, we get sort of traces of that um, as something that's already, um, emerging as an alternative. Because part of the thing, I mean, like the example where they decided the genealogy based on the people getting married, to do that, genealogy has to be oral. It has to be flexible so that people can make all the little adjustments to actually continue to accurately map and describe and reflect society. So already kind of putting it in writing, it's already in some ways taking, if we'll call it maybe a sociological model and turning it to theological work. Um, so I think there's already something with that. Um, okay. Um, th there are now a bunch of questions kind of asking about putting it all into practice, maybe reflecting on the, the task you've taken on in your new role. Um, one question, how do you create Jewish spaces that are intended to build community around a particular religious identity? How do you do that in a way that's inclusive of all Jews, maybe also of non-Jews? And uh, the, the question I ask, is this important? I think, um, I think you might find a lot of people in this room saying, yes, it's important, but uh, uh, I'll read, uh, read that as part of the whole question. How do you create Jewish spaces? What's our strategy? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that's a great question to keep asking. Um, I'll, I'll give you an answer, but I hope you don't stop with my answer. I hope you keep asking. Um, I think we should, I think it would help to lean into all these things like thinking about how we use genealogy to think about this idea of family and to think about, um, to really accept that we don't have to think about Judaism in the terms dictated, like we don't have to think about Judaism in accordance with American social rules, that Judaism can speak beyond American social rules and Judaism can inspire us to think about transforming American social rules. Because one of the things I really, one of the things that really is really critical is this idea that some of these things we take for granted, they're not real like people made them up and the history that they've created is very real and we have to deal with that. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that's, they have to structure our lives forever. It doesn't mean that we have to, we can't imagine the world outside of them. And if we really get that it's not real um, and we start to see how we are creating it through our decisions and our choices and our perspectives every day, then we can start to make some different choices. Um, and that doesn't, you know, make like I said, it doesn't make all of history go away in an instant, but it it starts to move us toward a different future. And I think that's the critical thing to be able to really take seriously the world as it is, take seriously in the sense of seeing it for what it is and where it is, and and how things are and how things got to be the way they are, and kind of you know to to really see all of those things and be willing to see it, but not to settle for it, not to assume that this is because this is how it is, this is what has to be, that there's anything sort of inevitable about it. And to realize that I do think we really can 
change this. And, and I like to think about it. I, I like to, to compare it to language in a way. Like if you think about trying to say it sounds in a language that you don't, you know, if you try to learn a language now and there, there, there will be things that are hard to pronounce. There'll be sounds that this language will want you to make that, that it, your English chain mouth does not want to say. Um, that are difficult, that will come out. Uh, you may never get there, right? You will always, you may always, it may always be awkward. It may always be pronounced wrong. You may never quite get the accent, but your children can do better and your grandchildren can do even better. So there's a sense in which we, um, I mean, I'm thinking, and thinking we do have a very literal example in the, in the reemergence of Hebrew as a spoken language. Like people actually did bring a language back and it has native speakers. We can do that ideologically. We can think about some better ways of seeing in the world. And it may, it may never come natural to us to, to stop seeing the boundaries and divisions and limitations. We may always have it in us, even as we kind of decide not to act on them, but we can present it to our children in such a way that those things, that they don't take those things for granted. And our grandchildren may not even be aware of those things that seem so all, all present for us. Um, so I really do think we can, we can live into that possibility. Um, um I, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, um, just in thinking about community, if you really take seriously the idea that the diversity, you know, if you think of all the diversity within the world, is part of the Jewish people. What does it actually look like to put that into practice? If you keep asking that question, if you actually think, what does it mean to say that um, Lunar New Year, um, as celebrated in Asia, is Jewish? What does it mean to say that, um, you know, all these kinds of things, like what does it mean to say that these are part of the Jewish people, these are part of Jewish life? Um, Um, yeah, I think to keep asking the question. It, it is a, a very profound um, text that you started with. Um, let me ask you before we end, um, it's an amazing moment to have you here, not just to talk, not to talk about only your scholarship and your kind of uh, vision for putting it into the world, but as the head of an institution uh, now that's training the next generation of, of leaders in the Jewish community and, and spiritual leaders and pastoral leaders. Um, so maybe before we go, um, we could learn a little bit from you about, uh, about your vision and what you're putting into place in, in the RRC. Sure, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's very exciting. It's. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I think that rabbis do is envision, embody, and bring forth new possibilities for the world. I mean, to really think about ways of being human and new things. So not just, I mean, ways of, of thinking beyond common sense, of really transforming that, um, of, of, bringing about new and better realities, um, thinking about that as something we can do. Because a lot of times the struggle is, okay, we can say something isn't working or we can say something is bad, but it's hard to know what else to do. Um, we, we kind of look around and we go, well, these are the choices. And what does it mean to actually really create new choices to make new things become possible? Um, and so one of the things that I love about the education that we have at RRC is that we, we are training rabbis to understand the world, to really kind of see the world as it is and to transform it. Um, to, 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 and to kind of, to think about, to, to lead into how it can be different and how, um, yeah, it, in all kinds of ways that people are doing that. Um, yeah, so I think that is especially powerful because I think there, I think it's, there are, there's so many things we can look around and we can say, okay, this is bad and I've got to stop doing this and I've got to stop doing that. And I know this is a bad way of thinking about things, but it's, we often get stuck and think, well, what else do we do? What else is there? What alternatives are there? And I think one of the, 
one of the most powerful things that rabbis can do is um, through their engagement with tradition um, and through their reflection on the world and kind of thinking about that relationship between, between tradition and kind of what can we take from tradition for this moment, kind of how can we think to this moment and not only take from, you know, but how can we reflect on tradition and how can we meet those moment, this moment? Um, how can we have new, new ways of thinking, new ways of seeing, better ways of being human, better ways of thinking about community? Um, it, yeah, I mean, our students are, are really having, working through a lot of creative ideas about the kinds of communities that they're preparing to lead, kind of the, the forms and the structures of Jewish life, not only as they are, but as they're emerging, as they can be, um, and how to lead people through that, kind of how to lead people into the unknown. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, I'm so excited that you'll be able to meet later this week with our students. Um, before we close, I also want to flag for everyone our next public event on March 1st next week. Uh, we're going to host section four of our lunchtime series on civil society and plurality in Israel with bar -Ilan Professor Elisheva Rossman Stolman, who will be joined by Berkeley Professor Ronit Stahl to discuss gender, religion, and the military in Israel. Uh, please see the Helen Deller Institute events page for more information. And I think the link to that event might uh, also be put into the chat. And with that, I want to say, uh, Professor Mbuvi, thank you so, so much uh, from all of us. Um, and we look forward to, to seeing what you generate from Philadelphia outwards. Thank you. It's been great to be with you. Mm -hmm.